So, hi, I'm Eric. I just started working here, and I'll be one of your MCs. And um, our next speaker is coming uh, straight from Poland, and he works in application security uh, at Doyensec. And um, if you've been anywhere in the electron issue tracker, you might have seen him re report a bunch of security flaws. And um, today, Luca will be giving us a talk about um, democratizing uh, security in Electron Apps. So please, give him a round of applause. Hello. Hello. Thank you. All right. Um, so if you're here, you probably love Electron. Um, I try to find uh, you know, best quotes on, on Twitter. Uh, Felix even made a Windows 95 Electron app that runs on all operating system, which is crazy and good at the same time. Um, but you may not know that there are also security people that love Electron a lot, and that's for a different set of reasons, uh, mainly for you know, security issue and things that have been uh, problems uh, in the past. Uh, the first, uh, you know, the, the quote on the top, um, uh, Ben is comparing security of the Electron with Flash. Uh, which is not great because Flash has been a source of vulnerability uh, for, for quite a while. And also the end of the technology isn't, uh, you know, uh, the best outcome. Um, and so with, uh, you know, today's presentation, I want to kind of change that. Um, and I'm uh, kind of, uh, you know, uh, to blame myself. Uh, you know, I've worked in a bunch of roles as a security consultant and security engineer. And at the very beginning of my career, um, you know, I was a kind of a, a tin foil hat person, uh, but then uh, people get, you know, mature and get more, you know, get wiser. And uh, when you start building uh, application and then you have to fix vulnerability yourself, then uh, you realize how complex it is. Uh, I've been involved in Electron since uh, uh, 2017, uh, primarily reporting vulnerabilities. Um, so you know, haven't really contributed in code. Uh, my team actually is now working on reproducibility builds right now, so hopefully in a few days, uh, you know, let, let's be optimistic, a few days, you will be able to um, check where, uh, you know, the binary of Electron that you download from the website is the same that you made uh, yourself, uh, compiling from source code, uh, which is an important step for security. Um, and I've been involved in a lot of uh, Electron um, uh, security assessment. Um, I'm a co-founder of a small security boutique uh, with the office in San Francisco and Warsaw, Poland, where we basically focus on security testing. And uh, Electron started as a research topic for us and then turned into uh, kind of a, 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 you know, a good uh, business, uh, you know, uh, line. And uh, we've been doing a lot of assessment around that. So, you know, my perspective around security is also the perspective of someone having seen uh, multiple implementation of application uh, on top of Electron. Um, so what is uh, democratizing security all about? Um, before we go into the topic, um, you know, there are basically three goals from my presentation. One is, as, as I said, it's to uh, celebrate the, you know, progress we made. Um, I remember checking the project in 2017 and, you know, seeing a lot of things that, uh, you know, didn't seem right, and I will go through some of them. And not to, you know, uh, discredit anyone, but just to show the progress we made. So, you know, uh, it's, a, it's a day that we have to celebrate. Um, secondly, uh, you know, we, if you just started with Electron, hopefully I will give you some pointers. Uh, what are the important things for security? And then finally, uh, if you are among the contributors and, and, you know, people who are actually making Electron better, um, Hopefully, uh, you take my uh, comments and feedback as, uh, you know, as a way to spark a discussion on what really matters for security. Uh, so democratizing, to me, it's really making uh, you know, security accessible to everyone. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's possible to make a framework secure if you have to compile from source or there are crazy settings that no one knows around. Um, the idea is that uh, anyone doing, uh, you know, building an application will have security. Um, and I've been thinking on what are the things that are really necessary to get there. And, and those are my five points, and so we'll go through them. The first one is about security trade-off. And to talk about security trade-off, I have to talk about security and usability. You know, from one side, you can imagine downloading uh, Electron, everything, uh, you know, have everything locked down to the point that you start running your app, you get exception, you need to enable settings, change things, 
to make it work. Um, this is probably not what we want. Uh, at the same time, we also don't want a framework that you download, it works, but it also is completely open. So we need to decide what is the uh, thread model, uh, what are we trying to protect, uh, and um, you know, what is the right sweet spot uh, between security and usability. And you may be tempted to take a browser as an example. Um, so use the browser uh, thread model. Uh, and browser thread model is pretty complex. Uh, but if you just want to try to summarize, it's basically trying to prevent malicious interaction uh, between websites, right? So same origin policy and other uh, important mechanisms try to prevent that. And also prevent malicious interaction between a website and the host. Electron is not a browser. We do want, for example, to access the file system. Uh, your application may need to use um, operating system primitives and, and uh, mechanisms such as notification, uh, you know, software updates and other things. And so, uh, you know, the Electron browser comparison is not a one-to-one. -one. Um, as I said, we have to figure out what's the right sweet spot on hardening and, and usability. To talk about that, I wanted to introduce you to how a traditional exploit uh, works for electron vulnerabilities. So, and, and let's do a step back. So, a software defect that results into a security problem, uh, you know, that affects confidentiality, integrity, or availability, it's called a vulnerability. If someone writes a software to take advantage of that vulnerability, that's the exploit. And so, traditionally, for uh, electron application, what we have seen, uh, what we build ourselves, it's generally an exploit with a three stage. Uh, the first one is about taking control of the DOM. So you need a way, uh, the attacker needs a way to control um, the execution of HTML or JavaScript within the context of the application. Uh, this can be done, for example, through a cross scripting vulnerability, so arbitrary uh, JavaScript execution uh, in, you know, inside the render, for example. Um, or, for example, a man in the middle, right? So if you are connecting to a remote site and let's say you're using plain text HTTP, someone can manipulate the response and so can inject arbitrary JavaScript. Once the attacker controls the DOM, um, he or she can bypass the isolation if there is even isolation, right? If you're running your app with node integration enabled, then step two is not required. But generally speaking, most of the um, you know, major applications do enforce some sort of isolation, whether it's node integration or sandbox. After you bypass that, um, you have to, um, you know, you can use the uh, native uh, Node.js primitives. So that's the easy part. And so when we want to compare browser to Electron, um, you know, let's think uh, about two different orthogonal things, uh, actac surface and, and isolation. Um, so actac surface is what, what a framework, what your application is exposing uh, that can be used as an attack vector. And you know, in compared to a browser, Electron is actually um, in, in a better situation regarding uh, untrusted content. Um, because generally speaking, most of the application will not take a random URL. You won't you know, browse the website from your Electron app. Um, I think uh, you know, the Brave experiment uh, using Electron demonstrated that building a browser on, on Electron isn't the right thing. Uh, and they you know, now, uh, you know, a few months ago, uh, went back to you know, full Chromium. Um, the normal you know, app won't allow user to, to go on any, any random website. So this uh, limits the interaction uh, significantly, which is, which is great for security. On the other hand, it opens um, the venue for a local file and local resources that can be used to attack the application. So if you have a streaming um, application and someone can import subtitles, maybe subtitles are downloaded from torrent or website, well, that's also considered, um, you know, malicious, you know, potentially malicious input. Um, if you have an application that does, you know, image editing and someone, you know, loads uh, local files, local images, uh, the parsing of the images, all the processing of the image, that can also be uh, abused. On the isolation side, um, that's where the problems that uh, you know, those tweets uh, were referring to uh, 
basically, um, you know, boils down, which is uh, if you get an XSS, if you get a cross scripting, uh, it's fairly easy to uh, have remote code execution, meaning the attacker can execute arbitrary code on the machine, uh, which is obviously something we all want to prevent. Um, and this is basically making sure that things like node integration and, and sandbox are used and are used properly. Um, we have a tool, and I will, I will talk a bit about that, and we did some, um, you know, we crawled all the open source Electron apps and did some, some statistics around the use of Sandbox, for example, and, um, you know, th that's not really uh, used uh, in, in a lot of apps uh, for, for a set of reasons. So these things, um, you know, the, the lack of, the overall lack of isolation is the, the main problem. So we have to make sure that uh, cross-scripting will not lead to remote code execution. And then from an attacker perspective, uh, a really important aspect is the cost of an exploit, right? How much time, um, you know, a person has to spend on building an exploit. And the exploit for Electron apps uh, are actually very reliable because they basically boil down to rely to business logic bugs and use of native, um, you know, Node.js primitives, which are obviously reliable. So we're not talking about memory corruption or, or other classes of vulnerabilities. All right, so let's go now into number two, uh, framework bugs. Um, frameworks are not immune to bugs. Um, they are software like everything else, and uh, so they can have bugs. And you may think that um, if you build a framework and you have very good design, then, then it's all good. Uh, the reality is that if you have enough bugs, um, the design doesn't really matter. Um, it, it is still important. You still want to do security hardening at the design level, uh, but then you also need to make sure that the implementation is uh, sound. So, and I'm going to take uh, one vulnerability uh, in particular, which I believe is uh, the most severe vulnerability that ever occurred to Electron up to now. Uh, I'm sure that a lot of the maintainers uh, will remember this, uh, this bug. Uh, you may not remember the CV number, which is a, a unique identifier for vulnerabilities. Um, but you definitely remember uh, the window protocol handler RC bug. Um, and so I'm gonna go through what was the process to actually fix this bug. Um, again, not as a way to uh, discredit anyone that worked on these things. Uh, you know, I also worked uh, on, on it myself, but rather as, as a way to show how complex sometimes is to fix stuff. So the bug was, um, uh, was affecting uh, Windows Electron apps only. And the reason for that is um, you could, by, by basically triggering a URL protocol from uh, Internet Explorer or Edge, um, you could uh, piggyback on the arguments that uh, your application would use to, to, to be launched. So this code can be, you know, can be um, included in a, in a HTML page uh, hosted by an attacker. The attacker would convince the victim to go into their website. Uh, it will change the window location to uh, the protocol handler of the application. And it would use this trick to use the double quote uh, GPU launcher, which is a, a Chromium command line argument, to start calculator. Uh, and again, the root cause is the ability for, a, for an attacker to piggyback on uh, the way that Electron implements um, you know, the overall launching mechanism for, for Electron itself. Um, the reason I mention uh, Internet Explorer and Edge is because it's, uh, it was, you know, this bug was actually not exploitable on Chrome or Safari because the browser would, uh, you had encode the space, so you would not be able to technically do that, um, but that's kind of a detail. So there was a fix released after uh, reporting. Uh, that was, uh, I think, uh, January. Um, and a day later, um, the, there was a new fix uh, because the, uh, the overall fix was, was around blacklisting, but blacklisting was not uh, you know, taking consideration of lowercase and uppercase. So an attacker could do the same things by just having a GPU um, part uppercase, um, which was unfortunate. And then a few months passed by, and uh, we actually, uh, we were asked by one of our customers to analyze the patch and spend a, a week trying to figure out a bypass. Um, so we did that, and we did find a bypass. Um, it involved the use of, a, of another argument called OST uh, rules, which at the time was not included inside the blacklist. 
um, where basically it instructs the um, Chromium to pass all the traffic to whatever host uh, our, you know, is map uh, or our maps in the host rules. So in this case, we are mapping traffic to any website, you know, the wildcard to, uh, you know, our malicious server. So it was basically a way to force a man in the middle. Um, and, uh, you know, that's great. Uh, you know, we reported this bug. Um, you know, my customer was happy. Electron team was also happy that we, we got something else. Uh, and we all thought it was the uh, end of the story. And so that's where, you know, uh, we always, uh, in security, we, you know, it's always good to have a reminder that there are, you know, out there people that are smarter and, uh, you know, invest more time. Um, someone came up with a new attack, um, and, and this is a pretty interesting one. Um, the attack, uh, so what would you see is the exploit, and you would notice that, uh, well, what looks like a line is actually two, uh, two dashes there. Um, you know, the two dashes uh, marks the hand of the command line switches, and electron parsing stops there, so it, uh, as, uh, you know, Chromium uh, does. But node uh, switch processing ignores the, uh, the dash dash. So what ends up happening is that electron will go through the blacklist, uh, then stop at the uh, dash dash, um, and basically ignore everything. But then when, when launching the electron app, um, the inspect uh, argument would actually be, under, you know, would be uh, totally legit for Node.js, and so that brings Electron under the bug import uh, 555 on localhost. And then there is another attack uh, called DNS rebinding, uh, which is kind of outside the scope of, you know, the talk. Uh, very interesting, uh, you know, attack technique, where basically a remote page can access uh, localhost uh, binding services. So. Combining those two things, a remote attacker can connect to the Electron debug port, well, first of all, start the Electron with the debug port and then connect remotely, um, which is pretty devastating because at that point you can inject code. Finally, we got to a hand of this vulnerability. Um, it was fixed in a first attempt with, you know, blocking again the, the, the blacklist uh, and then also backporting uh, DNS rebinding protection. Um, the problem was that uh, it's, you can still piggyback on, on custom uh, application arguments. Um, there were a few applications out there that basically, uh, you know, started supporting uh, custom arguments, and since they were not part of the blacklist, uh, could be used, uh, which again led to remote cause execution in a bunch of apps. Uh, and so starting from D3, no more command line arguments, and also, um, you know, edge and, the uh, Internet Explorer uh, now encodes. Uh, I haven't tried myself, but that's what the people tell me. So this was a good happy ending after a lot of month of work and uh, struggle. Um, the next one is around poor and consistent documentation. And I want to use as an example um, a very small things yet very important. And as a developer, uh, that's, that's one of the takeaways from today. On, uh, on Electron page, uh, there is a security native capability and responsibility page, which is a summary of a security checklist and a bunch of things that uh, um, you, know, you have to do if you want to secure your app. And up until last year, um, you know, there was a version on the top, and then um, we changed to in, uh, include enable context isolation. So relatively small change, yet very important. Um, if you don't have context isolation, you basically have an all integration bypass. Um, it's, a, it's due to a new class of vulnerability that it's been you know, known for, for a while. Um, and it, it takes advantage of a technique called prototype pollution. Uh, so I'm gonna show you a quick example. Um, and it's fully mitigated if you use context isolation. Uh, the point is that it's very difficult to use context isolation because you basically kill um, you know, all the objects that you are trying to export to the window object from your preload. Um, and so a lot of apps, um, you know, had and, and will have to adjust the design and the implementation to make the, this possible. And this is still an optional uh, setting. So if you just take uh, uh, Electron out of the box, you don't, have a con you don't have context isolation enabled, even on the latest stable, 7.1 something, and then beta uh, 8.7. Uh, um, so, uh, I anonymized uh, 
I think in a way that you should not recognize this app even if it's your code, uh, hopefully. Um, so this app had a, an isolated browser view um, and was using both node integration, uh, isolation, and sandbox, um, which is, you know, seems uh, exactly the way you wanna, you wanna do and it was, you know, according to the documentation uh, back then. Uh, however, uh, there was a use of preload, which is pretty common. And one of the preload had uh, the following code. It was basically an IPC proxy mechanism where the user from the render could send logs. Um, and the developers knew that uh, it's, it's dangerous to allow arbitrary uh, IPC, uh, IPC communication. So they were whitelisting a few um, channels. Uh, the one on the, you know, in the array on the top. And the validation was done with an if statement, uh, exclamation mark, IP, uh, IPC whitelist includes, uh, you know, the, the, the user supplied IPC. Uh, which seems all good until you realize that if you don't have a context isolation, uh, then you can do what I, what I mentioned. So you can do product pollution. So on the top of this exploit, so this would be the attacker page, uh, you see that we are overriding the includes function uh, from, you know, in the array uh, object to always return true. So basically to always uh, bypass uh, the, the if statement that would prevent. And then you could use a nice trick, uh, which is to piggyback on Electron um, internal IPC, um, you know, the Electron browser, you know, underscore browser, to send, uh, you know, to, to get, do a require and then call uh, uh, function. Um, so um, context isolation is very important. Uh, we have updated the documentation since then. Um, again, I think the issue with making these, uh, these settings to be enabled by default is, is primarily uh, make sh you know, making sure that you know, apps will not completely break. And it does require a significant change on, on several apps out there. But it's something that it would have to be done. Um, and there are mechanisms and um, uh, work around that, uh, so we, we can talk during the um, you know, during question part. Um, fourth point is around security governance. Uh, when I started, uh, this was an example of a bug fix change log. Can you spot the security vulnerability? And uh, if you know uh, because you worked on that, please don't spoil for the others. All right, so, uh, so back then I had no idea about you know, which vulnerability Electron had, and if the best things uh, a security engineer can do to understand uh, you know, future vulnerabilities to, to see past vulnerabilities, and I couldn't find anything on the internet, so I decided, okay, let me spend time on the, on the GitHub issues to figure out which you know, patches and fixes were related to vulnerability. And, and you can see here the pattern where uh, the last issue doesn't have a pull request, uh, which is kind of strange since it's all open source and there is a pull request, it's just not linked. And then there was this sentence, did not behave as expected, so I downloaded all the issues and uh, change log, search for this exact sentence, and actually turned out to be a list of 15 over bugs. And so this allowed me to do a diffing much better because I could just diff the two version. Um, which was great, and then uh, um, the team was amazing because after like probably two days after I reported that, uh, they started introducing tagging for security fi uh, fixes, which is extremely important, and I, I really want to iterate. For Defender, uh, this is one of the best things uh, that uh, maintainers can do uh, because it allowed defenders to decide, is it time to upgrade for a security fix or can I hold on and wait because I don't care about the new fancy functionalities. Um, so, uh, yeah, this, this is a really, really important aspect. And then since then, uh, now Electron has an amazing vulnerability disclosure practice. Um, there is a web page, uh, you know, security markdown files, uh, an email to receive uh, security bugs. Um, it, it improved a lot also from the incident response management standpoint. Um, as you know, there is also a security work group. Um, where um, there is a, a precise inter response runbook, um, so who should be notified, when, how. Each vulnerability, and you may have seen from the blog post, 
generally receive external uh, communication once it's patched, uh, which again helps Defender. Um, and then things that are not strictly security related help security a lot. Uh, frequent releases and semantic versioning, uh, very important as well. And then shorted update cycle for Chromium. Uh, it's, it's an amazing step. Um, I do want to make a comment, um, which uh, may sound uh, controversial, I, I, I think, but uh, you know, uh, it, it's great, and we should keep uh, updating Chromium as much as you know, as fast as we can. Uh, but it's not the end of the day for security if there is a few days delay. Uh, the reason for that is, if you look at the history of vulnerability in Chromium, are generally triggered by parsing of HTML and JavaScript. If an attacker already runs JavaScript or HTML on your application. I'm very confident that there are probably other ways uh, if the application is not ardent enough to subvert the security. So this is to say that we still need to upgrade Chromium, um, but your application should prevent the execution of JavaScript in HTML in the first place, uh, and without those, most of the security bugs in Chromium won't really be uh, applicable. Um, um, so you know, no panic if there is a, a Chromium bug that is out there. Most of the time, that won't be a big deal. Uh, and finally, it's uh, about you know, how you build your app. Uh, we try to summarize um, all the important security recommendation in a nice list. Um, if you want to have a short version, that's, that's this slide probably. Uh, do not load remote content uh, if possible. There are a lot of ways to uh, embed your resources within the app. Um, if you really have to, make sure that you control the, you know, you fully control the domain where you're loading the content from. Uh, make sure there is uh, TLS, right, uh, you know, HTTPS, so secure communication between the app and the server. Um, but if you can, again, do not load remote content. Um, use modern framework to build the front end, uh, React, Angular, whatever you prefer, as long as it has uh, contextual encoding, meaning it will prevent cross scripting by default and you have to opt out. Enable node integration, uh, well, rather disable node integration, uh, sandbox through, and, and as we mentioned, uh, context isolation, and then preload script. Um, a lot of the time, applications are, you know, secured, but then preload reintroduces problems, uh, whether it's by reintroducing a Node.js object or by reintroducing dangerous primitives. Uh, be careful and review your preload script. And if you think it's too much for you to do, um, uh, well, you have to do it, but then we can help you. Um, we released and maintain a tool called Electronegativity. Uh, it's been around for, I think, a couple of years now. Um, and it's a static analyzer uh, that parses AST and um, the DOM to detect misconfiguration um, and, uh, and security anti-patterns. So we took basically the checklist and made uh, static checks for those. Um, and you can download and install, uh, you know, we can, you can see the code, you can install from code or, you know, from source, or you can just install through NPM. And we released one for, uh, for, for the conference with a bunch of new things. So the way you basically, ju you just run the tool, um, it's a command line tool, and uh, it will give you back the findings. Um, you can also click on the links uh, on the right to get more information. Uh, we spend a lot of time making uh, nice documentation on each finding. And um, what, one thing that I did not mention is you can run on the code, but you can also run on the final Azar file. So it will take care of doing everything. So it works perfectly well also with the closed app. Um, and then if you use a the Mac, there is an amazing feature of uh, link, you know, uh, hyperlinks on, in terminal where you can directly open uh, the source from the terminal, which if you're doing code review, it's very useful. Uh, we support a bunch of uh, output formats, uh, comma separated and serif, which is a static analysis format uh, for, for, from, you know, generally used for, for such tools. Uh, the cool thing is that you can have this one integrated in your CI CD pipeline, push the logs to somewhere uh, where you have a script that, you know, do parsing and, um, you know, that does parsing and, and, and push somewhere else like a JIRA or something like that. Now, I have to say that it's uh, primarily a tool for, manu you know, manual analysis, so it's not meant, you know, it's not meant to be a point-and-click tool. Uh, a lot of the issues uh, are marked um, 
with the manual review required. Uh, you see on the red when it's showing there, uh, review required. Uh, that means that uh, the check itself has been built in a way that we cannot be sure, you know, we don't have a lot of confidence saying it's a, it's a real issue, it could be a false positive, so you have to go in. Uh, but it's still, I, th I believe, very, very useful. And so to close my talk, uh, I want to just recap uh, what I believe are the five steps to make security for Electron uh, available to everyone. Um, maintainers have to figure out what is the, that sweet spot of uh, built-in uh, by default settings that will ensure um, a safe and, and you know, reliable execution. Uh, making it also easy to opt out if someone has to. Um, for framework bugs, there is nothing else than hardening and more security testing and, and repeating. And the same goes for documentation. Um, I think we're in a very good state for security governance. Uh, the OpenJS Foundation and, and such, it's, they are all steps that will also help um, security, so that, that's great. And then obviously it is important that you know your tool, uh, so you know you, the framework you're using and you apply uh, secure coding practices. And with that, if you have uh, anything even after, uh, that's my email, my Twitter handler, and uh, some, some research we did in the past. And then, uh, yeah, just Google for electronegativity and you will find the tool. Um, it's on GitHub and NPM. Um, so thank you, Luca. Um, now we have time for questions, if anyone has any. I have a question, like how does Slack handle the electron code signing? Uh, well, I haven't looked at Slack, and uh, so I cannot really speak for that. Uh, code signing, it's, uh, it's complicated, uh, and that goes into also the updates. Uh, Felix made a joke about updates, it's still not fixed. Um, um, it really boils down to how you know, different platforms support uh, the code signing part. Um, and uh, you will actually, we are actually close to release a, a bug in, uh, in a set of blog posts around one of the popular um, library to do software updates for Electron, uh, where uh, the code signing valuation is, is kind of broken. And yeah, I don't think there is a, a solution out of the box out there that will allow you to do easy code signing and also um, check uh, during the upgrades. Uh, but it's not, a, like, the good news, it's not just a problem of Electron. Uh, you know, on, on Mac, uh, works kind of great uh, because there is, a, you know, if you, if you push the app, for example, to Apple Store. Um, but uh, other platform, uh, you know, on Windows, unless you push to the Windows Store, there's not really a good solution, even, even outside Electron. Thank you. So, yeah. Do you recommend any tool in future? Can you use Microsoft? Like Microsoft. Uh, sorry, do you recommend any tool for the code signing like... Uh, well, I mean, if you can... Uh, Microsoft Authenticate Code. So, I mean, if you want to have, uh, like, the best, uh, you, know, um, you know, the best security, uh, you would have to use, uh, you know, the stores. So, Apple Store, Windows Store, and on, on Linux, uh, you would have to use the, uh, you know, the APT gets, uh, you know, GPG validation. Uh, and that works, but um, I mean, Apple Store it's fairly accepted on uh, you know on the Mac user base. Windows Store, I'm not sure. So, um, so you mentioned that disabling node integration makes the security better. Uh, can, can you repeat? Uh, you you basically, uh, you recommend to disable node integration to make the application more secure. Yeah. But this makes it practically impossible to use custom C++ add-ons. Well, no. So you so have. So what's your recommendation? Yeah. On that? So you have to design your application so you have multiple renders, and um, the one that don't have to, in, you know, don't have to touch the file system, don't have to integrate with the file system, don't have node integration, um, and then the user IPC is the real way where you have a few things that you have to do. Uh, they are invoked by the render to the main process, uh, and, and, and that's the only things that you can do. Um, you should not enable node integration for the entire app. Um, you could do it if you don't have absolutely um, user input, 
but in most cases, I mean, you're parsing user supplied content. Even if you don't have web pages, you're probably importing or using data uh, that the user has on a machine. So, do you know if ev anyone ever thought about whitelisting Node, which uh, which we could allow for Node integration? Because you could say like, hey, I want to enable node integration, but I want to only allow my particular add-on and no other add-on. I mean, it's complicated. The, the, I, I can tell you, for example, um, there used to be the buffer object to be uh, included into the global objects um, after, even after you do node integration off, uh, no, 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 node integration falls, uh, which, uh, you know, what is the problem, right? Just the buffer, the original. And then it turned out you can actually use buffer for a pretty nasty stuff uh, to the point that you could disable node integration. Um, buffer, for example, has an insecure allocation. Th there are a lot of things. So even um, things that don't look like potentially dangerous, it may turn out to be, to be dangerous. So I don't think we should go into a, you know, that would not be my advice into going into a white listing of specific node API. Um, Again, there is a, the, the, the right solution is to export um, specific IPC calls that you want to make from the render, from the untrusted render, uh, that will make sure that you can only do those things. Uh, okay. Thank you. Hi. Hi there. Thanks for the talk. Um, I have context isolation off and node integration on in my web browser. And... I, um, can you just explain a little more what context isolation is yeah. for me? And then the second thing is, and you talked a little bit about it now, how would I design my app so if I did want to use a Node API, it's secure? And you mentioned something about two renders and IPC yeah, so or the preload scripts. Maybe you can talk. Yeah, let's start from the first one. So what is doing context isolation? So there is these things called isolated words where basically um, you are um, maintaining different sets of, you know, global objects. So from a, if you don't have context isolation and your preload script, you do something like window.luca and you assign a string value, uh, then that, you know, that, that, that value will be available on the global objects on the render. On all the renders or? Well, uh, yes. On where the, the preload runs. So when you disable context isolation, uh, each render will have a specific context. So your render uh, won't uh, interact with the globals on, uh, on other renders uh, on Electron itself. Uh, because prototype pollution, I showed you an example where you uh, prototype pollute a, a native JavaScript function. And this does not only affect your app, it only also affects native Electron code. So context isolation and isolated words is important because you are isolating your malicious, well, your uh, untrusted render to both other renders, uh, the Electron app, as well as the Electron framework code. Um, for the other one, it's, uh, for the other question, it's, it's a bit more complicated. It really depends, you know, how many renders you have and, and other stuff. Um, I mean, the general approach is that um, you should not have uh, node integration enabled everywhere. Um, if you're loading untrusted content, you should isolate that through a web view or you know, a browser view and have not, not isolation only uh, you know, disable on that one. If that's the only things that it's rendering untrusted content, uh, but really depends on, on the design of the application. So, um. Thank you. One over there. I understand that, uh, you know, we uh, remote endpoints are like bad, and you really shouldn't do it. Um, but uh, how out of the question is uh, like an authentication, like handshake between uh, a remote endpoint and node? Well, no, you would do it through APIs. So it's so my, my argument is not that you should not interact with a remote server. Obviously, you know most of our apps have to interact with a server, but you should do it through uh, you know APIs. You should make sure that you know to, to who you're talking to. Uh, so you can implement certificate pinning, which is a, a technique to make sure you are uh, you know, validating the certificate to a specific certificate, not just that the certificate is valid and signed by a trusted CA. Um, and then you do API communication, and that's totally cool. Uh, the problem is that uh, you know, there are a lot of apps, well, not a lot. I think uh, the situation is, is getting better and better, but at the beginning, people took Electron as an easy way to port a web app to the desktop. 
And so what they did, they just basically built a container and uh, display the same login that you would have on the, on, on the web app, and that's really not the best for security. So it's the UI part that you should not display in a web view, um, in a browser view or uh, browser, uh, you know, window of context. Um, so that is all the time we have for right. this Q&A. Uh, thank you very much to Luca for his talk. <laughs>